Julie here. Before we get started, I want to tell you something that I'm on a quest for right now, and it's to grow the Mother's Quest community. If you're seeking a more epic life and want more of the conversations and resources we discuss here on the podcast, take a moment to press pause, sign up for yourself for the Facebook group or the email list at mothersquest.com, and invite some like-minded friends to do the same. Thank you. Okay, on to the show. Hey, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best mom! self. Mom! <laughs> I'll be right there. Where was I? In the months leading up to a big milestone birthday, I decided it was time to stop sidelining my dreams and realize that I'm the hero of my own journey. I knew I didn't want to do it alone, so I created this podcast to learn from other moms on their own quest so their words of wisdom and lessons learned could help light the way for mine. I created this podcast for myself. Come along with me and you'll find some treasures of your own. Welcome to this very special Father's Day edition of the Mother's Quest podcast. In honor of Father's Day, I'm so excited to bring you this conversation with a friend, former colleague, mindful father to two children, and a champion for underserved youth in Los Angeles, someone who I admire deeply, Tony Brown. Before I tell you more about Tony and the highlights of this episode and introduce this week's dedication, I want to let you know that I've officially launched the Mother's Quest coaching programs. I'm particularly excited about a signature offering called an Epic Life Reflection and Strategy Session. If you've loved the interviews on the podcast and even imagined what your own responses might be to my questions, this offering will give you that opportunity to go deep about the way in which the Epic Guideposts show up in your life, explore what you want more or less of, and commit to key action steps. We'll record our conversation for you to listen to again, and I'll follow up by email to provide some accountability so you know you have a coach in your corner paying attention and cheering you on. Visit the Work With Me page at mothersquest.com to learn more and sign up. For a change with this episode, I'm so happy to shine a light on the incredible fathers in our lives. This week's dedication for a special father comes from my friend and fellow podcaster, Kristen Downs. Hello, Mother's Quest community. This is Kristen Downs joining you from the Notable Woman podcast. I am so excited to be here today to dedicate this Father's Day episode. Julie, thank you so much for having me. Now, if you know me, you know that my dad is awesome and I love him so much, but I didn't realize when I was younger how awesome he was. I didn't really understand it until I got to college and I started to meet other people and hear about their fathers to understand how amazing a man he is. He coached our sports teams. He ran our youth and teen group. He took us to dance class. He chaperoned our field trips, and and I know he has a lot of stories about that. He's just a kind, generous, and lovely person. And this past Valentine's Day, he found out that he had a mass on his pancreas. And that mass has turned out to be stage four inoperable metastasized cancer. And so now my family and I have had to contemplate what life would be like without him. And it's hard. It's impossibly hard. So on this Father's Day, what I want to say to you is to love and appreciate that father that you have with you whether it's your own biological father, whether it's a stepfather, whether it's your husband, whether it's a father figure who's taking care of you, love that person. Appreciate the time you have with them. Rock it out. And a happy Father's Day to everyone. Thank you, Kristen, for this touching dedication and for reminding us to not take any moment for granted and to fully appreciate the fathers in our lives. So I want to seize this opportunity then to make some of my own acknowledgements. To my own father, David Lieberman, I'm so blessed to celebrate Father's Day with you this year. 
You've been the most powerful example of how to live life with integrity, to pursue fate with inspired action, and to bring humor and a full heart to our family. My father-in-law, David Neal, you're a true renaissance man. I admire your entrepreneurial spirit and how you show care and interest, not just in me and my children, but with everyone around you. And to Chris, my husband, you're the best father to Ryan and Jacob that I could ever ask for. You never hesitate to invest in our children and their learning. You're the perfect yin to my yang and a grounding force I count on every day. You often feel like you're invisible in this mother's quest of mine, but the truth is I would not have the faith or foundation to be on this quest without you. For you, there's one last message in honor of Father's Day. This is Ryan and Jacob wishing you a happy Father's Day. Thank you for being an amazing dad and for being a shining example of who I could be when I grow older. I love you, Dad. You're the best, and I hope you have a Good day, and I love you. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest today. Tony Brown is the executive director of Heart of Los Angeles, also known as Ola, where he's touched the lives of thousands of children, helping to break the cycle of poverty and replacing it with opportunity. Tony and I met when we were both just out of college, working together at Ola, where we instantly became friends and felt we were part of a family. In a nurturing environment that really does feel like family, Ola provides underserved youth near downtown LA with exceptional programs in academics, arts, and athletics, empowering them to develop their potential, pursue their education, and strengthen their communities. Tony served as the executive director of Ola since 2007 and has spearheaded incredible growth in the number of youth served, new buildings to house the programs, and relationships with world-class partners. Ola collaborates with the Los Angeles Philharmonic to furnish instruments and music instruction with performances at major venues across California and abroad. Leading museums link Ola with professional artists and exhibit student works. Bard College graduate students provide academic and music support. And the Los Angeles Lakers partner in sports programs. For this work, Tony has received tremendous recognition, including a $200,000 James Irvine Leadership Innovation Award accolades from the Center for Nonprofit Management, and in 2014, he was featured as a TEDx speaker. In this episode, Tony shares how growing up in the 70s in a community without other Black families shaped his character and helped him develop tremendous patience and understanding. He tells us how his mother challenged him, pushed him to become independent at an early age and to become his best, and how he feels he's on a quest himself to make the world a better place than how he found it, not only through his work at Ola, but through expanding the understanding and worldview of his two young children. We also talk about how difficult it is to sustain oneself amid the emotional and challenging work as an executive director and youth developer, and how he learned the importance of literally jumping back in the pool to start playing water polo again, to relieve stress and reconnect with this essential part of himself he had begun to lose. It was so wonderful to get a dad's perspective on the podcast and to see how the same epic guideposts resonate for fathers as well. I left our conversation inspired by how Tony brings a sense of patience that he's cultivated his whole life to give young people at Ola opportunities, even when they've had a failure. The importance of jumping back in the pool and how that can be an analogy for returning to our true selves and the things that make us who we are and the importance of holding a big vision and how we can do more together when we work in partnership. I'm Julie Neal, and this is a special Father's Day edition of Mother's Quest. So Tony, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast, Father's Day edition. I am so excited. I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with you. I'm so excited to be here, Julie. This is really awesome to be like the dad on the mother's quest. So I was telling you just before we pressed record that I knew I wanted to interview a father. And when I thinking about who do I know who's a great dad, who's doing such incredible work in the world, you immediately came to mind as the person I just knew I had to have on the podcast in this really special honor. 
So I'm so excited to be able to hear about what your experience is as a father and what kind of quest you're on and the amazing work that you're doing at Heart of Los Angeles, where the two of us met so many years ago. Well, so I always like to start with all of my guests with a question about the impact that your mother had on shaping you. So tell us a little bit about your childhood and Mm. about your relationship with your mom. Wow. You know, I think my mom was great at helping me to find my confidence. She was always so supportive of activities that I would try to do, leadership roles I would try to take, everything from, mom, let me show you this play that I wrote, to, mom, will you come be the audience for, you know, this production that we're going to do on our little neighborhood block, to, mom, I think I want to join the choir, or, mom, I think I want to try swimming. And she was always She was always saying yes and giving me these opportunities just to find that confidence that I could do just about anything I put my mind to. Uh, And I also say my mom was great in that she challenged me quite a bit. So if she didn't like my idea, she would tell me so. She would still let me try it anyways. (laughs) And sometimes she was right and sometimes I was right. And she was proud of me either way for trying. So I really feel like that's what my mom was all about when I was growing up. And later in life, I think as a sort of a young person going into his teen years, there were probably a lot more no's, but I would then go run around the corner and ask my dad, (laughs) right? Like every good kid seems to do. Now that I have my own kids, I'm seeing that firsthand. But, uh, you know, my mom still came out to support me. She never, even if she didn't necessarily agree with the choice that I had made. If it was something she saw I put a lot of effort into, I could always count on her to be there for me. Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a little town called Sierra Madre. And it's near Pasadena and the Rose Bowl. It's near, you know, La Cunada. There's It's near, you know, some incredibly, I'd say, affluent neighborhoods, um, as it's also near neighborhoods that were challenged, you know, much like a lot of the Southern California, LA area anyways, you know, you have these pockets of wealth and pockets of those who are really struggling. And, you know, I grew up in the early seventies. I'm pretty confident we were the only black family in that town when we first moved there. And that brought with it a significant amount of cultural challenges, particularly because we didn't, it was, it was pre, you know, era of political correctness, right? <laughs> That's not politically correct. There was none of that. There was the speech that I would get from my dad often because I'd come home crying about something or another. And he would say, son, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words, they'll never hurt you. Now get back out there. You know? mm. uh, whereas my mom would give me a good listen and a great big hug and remind me that she thought I was a pretty special kid mm. and that I should just keep plugging away. And so it was tough to grow up there in different ways. But at the same time, it was extraordinarily safe. So, you know, probably no communities 100% amazing. All communities probably have their challenges. But mine happened to be typically, you know, being a black kid in the white neighborhood and then seeing family and friends who were growing up in other neighborhoods that were perhaps either more diverse or all black neighborhoods have a different sort of experience. So I was trying to find my place in all of it. Yeah. And so what do you think has been the impact of that way, the, you know, the way that you grew up on how you live your life now? You know, I think the way I live my life now was impacted certainly by my childhood. And I think what I had to learn when I was a child was patience, mm-hmm. patience with other people. You know? you know, I think sometimes we're quick to call folks racists when we actually they might just be ignorant. <laughs> Right. And they just haven't really experienced, you know, what you've experienced and what they really need is to hear your point of view. They really need to get to know you as a person. And I realize that some people truly are capable of coming around, so to speak, of getting to know who you are as a person and realizing, wait a minute, you know, you're maybe I'm the one who needs to do some growing. And maybe it's through my experience and getting to know you that my life is expand a little bit more. And I can tell you that I had some childhood friends who had parents who definitely 
would be on the far end of the spectrum as so totally politically incorrect <laughs> in things they said in front of others. But it was sort of through a lifetime of having to deal with me, not in a negative way, but just having to understand how to communicate properly with the person like myself who was different than they were that has helped them to grow. And I feel ever blessed that some of those adults came around to me much later in life after I graduated college and said, wow, you know, I learned a lot by mm. uh, my experience with you, right? And that was sort of the ultimate in empowerment. And it taught me that, you know, you have to be at the table to make progress. You can't just run away from it. You know, you can't just tweet it and, and disappear, you know? Yeah. So I think that's probably what growing up in that neighborhood taught me as the biggest lesson. When I think of you, there are, I almost can't think of anybody else I know who has this ease with people, such a, like a graciousness. You really do seem to me to be a connector. And I know that you bring that into your work. And we'll probably get a chance to talk later. So it's interesting to now hear some more about your childhood and to know what some of the roots are of that really unique gift that you have. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I think, you know, I think part of development and part of growing up is to experience things, right? And, you know, I think we learn from the most probably from our challenges, right? And so all of these things that didn't take me down made me stronger. And, you know, you just, you don't give up. You just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep trying to live the best life for yourself. And I think if you're able to do those types of things, and that's what I think I try to pass forward to my kids and to the kids that I meet at my work. You know, be your strongest self. And you'll be all right. Hmm. Well, that is a good segue for me to share a little bit more about the frame for Mother's Quest, this venture that I began on the podcast. Because in many ways, I've identified that I'm on this quest and it is to become my best self. I say in my podcast opening that I have two high energy boys <laughs> that challenge me to grow into my best self. And they really do that every day. And about a year ago, I had this experience where I realized, you know, even though that I was living a great life and I did feel like I was making a difference in the world, I also felt like I had been sidelining some dreams of mine and they didn't feel like I was living the fullest expression of who I could be and having the biggest impact I could have. And I wanted to do that for myself and for my kids. So I've been on this really amazing journey over the last year. And in December, I officially launched the podcast. And this is now season two. Oh, um, you're the awesome. second guest on season two. Yay. And I just love bringing in mothers and now you with the father perspective to hear about you know, what your quest is to learn about the ways in which your children are challenging you to become your best self and to hear about your epic life. So epic mm -hmm. really has the connotation of what's the kind of story that you're writing for your life. And also it's an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I believe will help us to live an epic life when we're raising our children. Mm -hmm. So E stands for engaged, and that's about being mindfully engaged with your children. P is passionate and purposeful, making a difference beyond your family. I is invested in yourself because self-care and continuing to push yourself to grow and learn is so important. And C stands for connected so that you're in community on your journey. So we're going to dive into each of these guideposts and hear how they're showing up in your life. Great. I'm so excited. Too. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> this is awesome. And I, and I just, you know, for the listeners, I had the good fortune before we went on the air to, to watch just a little glimpse of your parenting uh, with your son. And it was really sweet to watch. You're an awesome mom. I can tell. Oh, thank you, Tony. Yeah. So I'm curious, before we get into the first guidepost, the E for engaged, how does this idea of being on a hero's journey and growing into your best self, how, how does that land for you? And if you feel like you're on a quest, what are you on a quest for most these days? 
Mm. So I think my quest is, and it's always eating at me. I had the good fortune of listening to Dr. Ross. He has the California Endowment and he delivered this speech on MLK's birthday at a breakfast luncheon. And his speech essentially said, if Dr. Martin Luther King were alive today, he would roll over in his grave. He'd be disappointed on so many levels. And Dr. Ross is of the baby boomer generation. And uh, essentially he said, I'm, you know, I'm part of this generation. And I'm telling you as a member of this generation that we have failed. We have failed in so many ways. You know, our planet, is heading in the wrong direction. The disparity between wealth and poverty is way too wide. And he just went down this laundry list of things. And it was just incredible. And he says, you know, the marker is, is that we were trying to find out whether we left this world better than the way we found it. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King would give us a failing grade. And that became how I, from that moment that I said, I want to engage in how I personally, and how I encourage others to make this world better than the way we found it. So I'm trying to understand what role and where and how I can do that. Be that passing through, you know, passing forward lessons that I feel like were valuable to me in making this world a better place to my kids, or doing the same thing for the organization that I run and the kids who come through those doors. So. And even my friends, my social circle, right? You know, when we're watching a college football game, there's no reason we can't engage in different types of conversation. And one of them is, hey, we've all got to kind of figure this out. Yeah. You know? um, so I think that's where engaged lands for me. And so how, you know, this first guidepost about being engaged mindfully with your own children, how does that show up for you as a father? As a father, I think the first instinct I have is to because we live in the suburbs and I, the first thing I want to try to do is show my kids everything from, Hey, do you see when we're driving down the street, do you see this? And we're by a, a drain, a storm drain. Mm. You know what this fish means? You know what this means? This means that the trash that we see on the ground and something, if it winds up here, it's heading to the ocean and that's a bad thing. Right. And so we have to be really mindful about our planet, about our earth and what we see on the ground. We can't just, run right past it, right? We have to take care of our, and my son and I, my daughter, we all love the water and we all love the beach. And so I tell my son, look, when we're surfing, again, this is where all this stuff ends up. And the, you know, the marine life, the plants, it all becomes affected by what we do all the way back home in that storm drain, mm-hmm. at the bottom of our street. So that's one of the things we talk about pretty often. You know, the other is, you know, I try to bring my kids down to where I work. <laughs> um, and went at least to the neighborhood in which I serve through my work. And I want them to understand that while we're very fortunate to have a home that you know, has multiple bedrooms and they each have their own bedroom, I want them to understand what city living looks like. And I want them to understand that there's a whole world out there who's living very differently than they are, right? And that we have conversations already about how do they end up that way, my kids will ask, right? And how does that happen? And it allows me to just sort of dribble as much as I feel like they can take in different reasons as to why there's so many homeless on our streets these days, you know, why families are living in tents, what mental illness is about, right? And we just start to talk about it. And we talk about what a lot of kids don't have and how nice and how enjoyable it is some of the things that my kids have and just the acknowledgement that not everyone gets those things. So. We just try to live in moments like that. I want them to see our world as a whole. And I ask my kids, how are we going to make this world a better place? And I'll tell you, I learned, I met a person not too, too long ago who has kids who are older than mine. And what he did was he gave his kids, let's just say for, I I don't remember the dollar amount, but let's just call it $100. And they each got $100 every year that goes into their special foundation. Yeah. And they have to determine, you know, how they're going to give that money away. Are they going to give it away a little bit? Are they going to give it away, you know, to multiple people? Are they going to give away one? And they're just, he's just sort of teaching philanthropy in a sense yeah. at an early age. And so I started to have those conversations with my kids too. So, you know, gosh, this house is going to be empty soon, I hope. 
if I had my druthers. But no, it's all about, you know, thinking about how we make this world better for everyone, not just for ourselves. Yeah. I love the awareness and thoughtfulness that you bring to your kids, you know, just, you know, in, for the environment and for understanding how people are living differently and that they can already at their young age, remind me how old they are again. Yeah, they're seven. Penelope is seven and Emily is five. Seven and five. And they're already beginning to realize that they have a contribution to make and that they can be philanthropists. It's reminding me, I'll link this in the show notes of my interview with Erica Graff, who has Mm. also two amazing children and they have their own, I think it's called the Budget Philanthropist. They have their own blog and website where they talk about and um, the ways in which they're making a difference, both in monetary contributions, but also in all of their action. Love it. So I'm feeling re-inspired to get my own children involved in that way. Let's move to the P because I'm having some more curiosity to hear you describe, you know, the community that you are working in. P is about that difference that you're making beyond your family. Tell me these days about the work that you're doing at Ola, which is where you and I met all those years ago. We were both staff members there. And now you've been the executive director for how many years now? Gosh, I guess it's been 14 years. No, that's not true. Sorry. It's been 12 years. 12 years. So tell me about the work that you're doing and the way that you feel like you're making a difference through Ola. Well, okay, so I think the difference that I'm hopefully making is that I'm providing uh, not only a safe place for kids to go in a neighborhood that doesn't feel safe at times. In fact, it doesn't feel safe very often at all. Um, But we're giving kids a safe place to go after school, which is the first little piece. But the larger pieces are we're giving them opportunities and chances to find their best self and to find their passion. And so uh, that could be through the arts. That could be through traditional academic subject areas, STEM and STEAM. It could be through visual arts, music, uh, STEM, STEAM, language arts, math, you name it, or athletics. And kids are, or leadership activities. And kids are given a variety of free classes and exposure, workshops, uh, mentors, guest artists, guest lectures, guest professionals, all helping these kids become the first ones in their family to enter into post-secondary education ultimately. And you know, now, Julie, we start with kids as early as age six, and we can see them from age six grow all the way into being the first in their families to go to college. It's incredible. So it's really fun to, to be a part of that journey, whether a kid starts with us at age six or comes to us you know, while they're in middle school or joins us as a junior in high school. They all have a, a pretty clear purpose that they want to advance their lives and be their best self. And they are coming to Heart of LA because they realize that this is a place to where they get the opportunities to get the help they need to get there. And oftentimes, you know, their families are hardworking, but that's what they're doing most of the time, you know, and they are not able for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're recent immigrant families and there's language issues. They're not able to help them academically. Uh, So we make sure now that we can support them in that effort. They're maybe not able to provide opportunities for their kids to practice activism, community activism, or community organizing. Because again, while the fire is there and the desire and the passion might be there, again, their parents may not necessarily have the time because they're trying to simply put bread and food on the table and working very long hours, multiple jobs. So part of LA becomes a lot of things to uh, over 2,300 kids throughout the year. So for me, this is about instilling in the kids who come that they have incredible strength from their personal journeys that they can absolutely bring forward to the current generation and future generations. Uh, I tell them all the time when I meet these young people, I'm so inspired by them. I tell them, you know what? You're the ones that I want to be in a trench with. You're the ones I want to be solving obstacles and you know the problems of today and tomorrow because you haven't fallen apart through a myriad of obstacles and challenges already yeah. you you know you picked yourself up and gotten back into it um, and you've never given up hope and if you so desire to be what you want to be and you keep that fire and recognize that your struggle is your strength 
you're going to be a powerful person that we can all be following. And you can absolutely make a contribution that makes life better for everyone. So that's what I'm constantly trying to instill uh, through my staff or through my you know, one-on-one opportunities with these kids. It's just, it's just amazing. They're very inspiring. I often talk with the guests on the podcast about this idea of an epic snapshot moment. You know, moments where in some ways like time slows down and you realize, oh my God, this is what it's all about. I'm curious what epic snapshot moment of your impact comes forward when you hear about that concept? Oh my goodness, there are a lot. So I'll give you three quick ones. One, there was a young girl named Ivania who, I don't know where dad was. I don't know if dad was even in the picture. It seemed to be always, as I knew her, all about her, her mom, and I think a younger sibling. And she, as a middle schooler, was part of the breadwinning for the family. And all she wanted to do was come to Olaf through our athletics program and play basketball. It was sort of her way of relieving stress. And she had a coach who was an alum. And the alum kept telling her, look, you can't just only come and play hoops at Ola. You, you know, don't you want to go to college? Don't you want to do more than play hoops for the rest of your life? And she told this alumni, you know what? You have to understand this. I'm with my mom raising money Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, sometimes till two in the morning, three in the morning. This is my relief. And I couldn't have said what came next, but this alumni having walked, you know, perhaps in some similar shoes said, I hear you, but I don't care. You need to get involved in the academic programs and the college prep programs. You're smart and you've got to put the time in. And she respected certainly her coach's journey and respected her coach. And so she started coming to our college prep programs. Well, the long story short, she graduated high school on time and was accepted to Brown University first in her family to go. And she came back. And this is one of those times slows down moments. She came back between her sophomore year and junior year, I think it was. And she says, Tony, I have some great news. And she says, I got an internship at a law firm in LA this summer. I'm like, that is awesome. You know, and I'm high-fiving and cheering, thinking that was the story. She said, that's not it. That's not the best news. I said, what's the best news? She says, my boss in LA has hired my mother. So she no longer has to work till two and three in the morning. Mm. So that was one of those moments to where, wow, through some of the work that we've done here, not only have we helped this young person, but we have also, I think, broken the cycle of poverty, you know, in kind of a two for one fashion. So that was one of those slowdown moments. And I think the other slowdown moment is more recent. It comes through our arts and music program. And it was a young man who started off with our, in our traditional academic programs. And he had a hard time growing up. You know, he had a hard time going through his maturity phase in you know, middle school and high school as a boy. And he kept messing up. Ultimately, he got thrown out of his high school and he was on continuation school number one. And then he was on continuation school number two. And then he came walking back into my office and he says, Tony, I'm done messing up. And I asked him, I said, well, have you, have you thought about playing the trumpet some more? because he used to try to dabble in the trumpet. He says, yeah, I'm still playing the trumpet. I said, okay, come here, I need to show you something. So I brought him over to our music program, which, you know, when he left us the first time, we didn't have an orchestra, (laughs) which we now do. We have multiple orchestras. And I knew this would get him, right? And so I brought him over to the building, and he saw 200 plus kids playing in an orchestra. And he thought, oh my gosh, you know, I just saw his, you know, the twinkle and the flicker in his eyes. Uh, This was amazing to him. Where nowhere else in his community you see this many kids, you know, playing in an orchestra program that looked and felt like uh, that he could relate to. Let's put it that way. And so I went to the director of that program and I said, this is my friend. And he, he's, had, he's had some tough times, but he, he's done messing up. And he, he wants to play. And the director, this is the old way, said, bring your trumpet tomorrow. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, he's on his way to Tokyo to play with L.A. Phil's conductor, Gustavo Dudamel and the youth orchestra program at Heart of LA, and the LA Phil's YOLA program. You got to go to Tokyo and play. And then later that year, when you turn on the television to watch the Rose Parade, there he was as a herald trumpeter, leading the pack, if you will, in the Rose Parade. And now he's in college. So that was a slowdown moment too, right? Yeah. So I love seeing those types of stories happen. You know, they're sort of full arc stories and that's life. They're just so representative of what life is all about. Ups, downs, and then these are kids who, through a community, a village that's so supportive, are able to get back up again. 
Well, I was on the website looking at, actually, I think I was watching a video. You got this award from the James Irvine Foundation, a leadership award. So I was watching the Mm. video about the work that you're doing at Ola. I was so struck by all of it, but in particular, you know, seeing what you just described of all of these kids in an orchestra, how unbelievable it is, how many instruments you have and the relationship with the Philharmonic. And I mean, it really is just incredible, the opportunity that you are providing to those young people. Well, I'm grateful. We couldn't do it without partners. And you know, and I know, I think we're jumping letters, but you know, when you, when you, <laughs> we'll get to the C. Yeah, you know what connected. I mean? It's like, I'm dying to get to the C because it's the only way you make this type of change happen. But yeah, I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> Thanks, Tony, because I am curious before we get to the C, you know, hearing you talk about the impact that you have on these young people. I know from doing that work with you at Ola and also all the years working in the youth development organization in the Bay Area here, where I've been so involved, Alternatives in Action, that that work, it can be emotionally exhausting. It often feels like your work is never done. The needs are so immense and it can really be difficult to sustain yourself. So I do want to hear what are the ways that you have invested in yourself that 12 years in now as the executive director of this incredibly dynamic organization, but one that I'm sure also has a lot of challenges. So how do you care for yourself and sustain yourself through this work? That's a really great question. Um, The best way, some of the best ways that I've found to do it are to recognize the work will always be there (laughs) and you absolutely have to turn it off. You have to give yourself the time to turn it off. Be it for me, I play water polo and that was what I got to play in college. I was excited to be able to do that. As you know, Julia, I had a brain injury and it sort of put that to a halt. In fact, doctors told me no more. (laughs) <laughs> no more playing. I mean, no more physical activity at that level. And I was away from it for about nine years. I was starting to feel, I think, the burden of this work in youth development. It absolutely feels like an uphill battle all the time. You know, there's, it's just, it's unbelievable. And I actually remember that day when I said, you know what, I'm actually gaining a lot of weight. It's not healthy. And I know I'm supposed to be taking it easy. That's not working either. Mm-hmm. Physically, I was supposed to be physically taking it easy. And I almost didn't recognize my former self. And I just said, you know, I'm going to get back in the pool. I'm going to get back into water polo. I really loved it before I got injured uh, or had the brain injury. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to tell people on the sideline, hey, first of all, do you remember me? I know it's been nine years. (laughs) But secondly, will you just keep an eye out for me? Because in case I have a serious episode, you need some back. And it was a tough first step, but I hopped back in the pool. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? Against probably any advice (laughs) people would give, I'm like, I'm playing this sport. And it gave me so much happiness. And I'm so grateful I got to score a goal. (laughs) And in spite of the fact that it nearly killed me, right? (laughs) Being away from a sport like that for so long and just sort of jumping back into it cold turkey. It was the best thing I ever did because seven or eight months later, I was back competing again and entered a tournament with a group of folks, played a three-day tournament over the weekend, long weekend. And I realized that this is my balance. And I'd say that's how you get through the work. You have to balance that work with something else as equally rewarding um, Mm. as you can, Even even if it's life or death. And I hate to say it that way, but I'm so passionate about the work that I get to do at Heart of LA, but I'm equally as passionate about making sure that I'm happy and healthy while doing it. Yeah. And that's really the decision that I had to make. And that's really what jumping back into the water was all about. And God has made sure that I'm going to be safe when I do it, but I am going to do it. And it's just made such a difference. You know, I feel like there's a hurdle or something to jump over just about every other day through our work. Uh (laughs) But you just sort of remind yourself, you got to balance that out no matter what. And when I come home and see my kids, it's hard. It is such hard work taking care of one kid, two kids, multiple kids. 
my hats off to all the moms out there because for me, I come home after working at Heart of LA and yes, I want to be, you know, old Tony who could have kids jumping on his back and, you know, me being the wild and crazy funny dad, but I have to balance there too. If it's a Saturday and a Sunday, it just can't be, in my personal opinion, it just can't be 12 hours with my kids. It might have to be eight hours with my kids and four hours for me. Right. And that's another area that I have to make sure that I would have some balance, right? Because I want everyone to get the best tone, not the worn down, beat up tone. You know? That's absolutely something that I think mothers and fathers, we all struggle with, but we've come to learn, many of us, that we have to take that time for ourselves. Have to. My mother, you know, you would ask me at the top of this, you know, about my mom and and what I remember from childhood. This moment right now that we're talking about truly reminds me of probably the biggest lesson I learned from my mom. I was the youngest of four boys, and there was 18 years difference between me and the eldest and 11 years between the closest to me. So I think I was a noobs baby, <laughs> number one. And number two, I think my mom and dad were probably just a little bit over raising kids. Right. And so, listen, I can tell you, there were very few family vacations that we went on during my lifetime. Mm. There were many, many more vacations that my mom and dad took by themselves where I was left with a babysitter. And they were going to some far away fun places without me. But you know what? I turned out just fine. Yeah. <laughs> Good and they for probably them. Came, came back refreshed. Yep. Good for them. And I try to make sure that I take time for me. And I want my partner to do the same. You know, I want her to feel the same way that she can take the time she needs for herself too. Yeah. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, that's actually a little bit more healthy. And I think For me anyways, my mom used to always say when I was a kid, entertain yourself. I'm not here to entertain you. But I don't feel like parents are saying that enough anymore. You know, I think that was a generation, uh, because my mom and dad were not baby boomers. They were World War II era folks, you know, and Jim Crow era folks. I don't want to put my mom's age out there, but let's just put it this way. She's lived a long time. She has a lot of life experience. Yeah, a long time of wisdom. And She's not there to kind of meet my every need at all times. <laughs> She's there to kind of make sure that I, you know, she picks me up when I fall down when I'm trying to learn some lessons out there. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting that you're sharing this now because our family just came back from an intensive family therapy experience at Pace Place. And I can put a link in the show notes too. Both of my kids are differently wired and mm-hmm. The folks at Pace Place are so helpful in supporting parents to better understand how to support their kids to really become more independent and grow into their best selves. And one of the things that Chris and I didn't realize is that we had really shifted things so that we were orbiting our kids. So everything was really around what they needed and doing things for them. And it, it was exhausting and they sure. really helped coach us in the days that we were there about how to shift that so that the kids are following more of our lead and also really stepping up and being more independent and helpful and supportive. And so last Friday night, we're bringing all the lessons back and had a different kind of dinner where then at the end of the meal, you know, we turned up the music and Every one of us, including our four and a half year old, was clearing the table and cleaning up and it really enjoying that time together. But it shifted from us kind of serving the kids to all of a sudden they had a part to play. So I really resonate with that lesson that your mom had been teaching you. It's something that has been very much at the forefront of our minds this week. Absolutely. No, that's right. And, you know, it's just, it's no one's fault. I see some of my older brothers and how they raise their kids and they did a pretty good job, but I see folks from their era and boy, you're right. They were orbiting big time, you know, and we, by the way, we orbit too. And it's a constant struggle, but I do remember. And I try to remind my house, my home that look, when I was in second grade, I remember my mother telling me, look, if you want breakfast, before I get up, you need to learn how to make breakfast. Right. <laughs> and I'm not talking cereal. I wanted eggs and bacon. Like I wanted, I wanted the good stuff. And so I learned at a very young age 
how to make breakfast. I really credit my mom and my dad, but I credit them both for giving me that opportunity to discover you know, what I really could and couldn't do on my own. Well, we are now at the, the guidepost that you've been waiting for with excitedly. Um, Community! See, we're connected to a strong support network. So sure. tell me how, you know, what are those connections so that you feel like you're in community on your journey? Well, so I think the biggest one is I had to come at some point and realize that, first of all, the C, there was a period of time in my life to where the C was competition, <laughs> ah. right? I mean, when I worked in the for-profit sector, especially, you know, in the, in the entertainment business and in the sports entertainment, it was all about competition. And when I came outside of that world and into, I think, a much better place for me, it then became about not always trying to do everything myself, but recognizing that there's more that can get done if you find a way to work together. And if you want to tackle some really big issues, better not to go at it alone. Better to go at it with partners and community. So, you know, I think about how my work has really grown pretty quickly. And it was through the partnerships that we've made that have accelerated that growth. So, for example, you know, one of the things I did at Heart of LA was I made every one of my managers at the time directors. I said, you know, I'm going to empower you to be directors. You don't have anyone over top of you in a sense now. It's really just about what gets you excited, what's a vision you have based on the experiences that you've had and been a part of with the kids in which we serve. What do you think as an expert is going to really move a needle for the, for the young people? coming through the door. And I want you to start to imagine it and and think about it and dream about it. What would be the best thing? So they were all coming up with these really cool, awesome dreams and visions. And I said, okay, now you only have 40 hours a week (laughs) to get all this done. How do you think you're going to get it done? And they said, I need more of this. I need more of that. I need that. We don't have the capacity. I said, exactly. We don't have the capacity to do it alone. But if we can partner with others, we can get there now, can't we? And that's what gave birth to not only, you know, a rock band and a big band, but more than that, a music program that's comprised of multiple rock bands, multiple big bands, an orchestra program, right, of hundreds of children, opportunities to play at venues all across the city and the state and the world. And that is because they were open to partnering with someone like the Los Angeles Philharmonic. It's because they were open to trying such contemporary music that they put themselves in front of a conductor who's from Cuba who does this thing up in Ojai that's just so bizarre and <laughs> you know, and crazy. That next thing you know, we've got kids playing at the Ojai Festival. I mean, these are the types of things that are possible when you open it up and partner. We have kids who found themselves from the, I guess you could say, the, the inner city of Los Angeles out in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina, becoming inspired through visual arts, where they, you know, through a partnership with Penland School of Crafts up there, you know, our kids are absolutely transformed by being able to go on to a campus of young people all the way through, you know, senior citizens who have works in the Smithsonian and, you know, Architectural Digest, and there they are taking a glass blowing class, our kids alongside these experts and these professional artists, right? And realizing for the first time that, oh my goodness, there's a cow on campus, number one. (laughs) But number two, there's this whole world of artists who this is what they do. This is how they live. This feels like me. These are partnerships. It never could have happened without that. Um, You know, I have kids who, young not kids, they're young adults who say, you know, I want to go into social work. And then I say, well, how about, have you ever thought about teaching in communities in which there are kids who struggle through a lot of toxic stress and social issues. Have you thought about becoming a teacher? Because you've had your experiences and you've been able to get into undergrad, you know, and graduate from college and you're an alum now. But have you ever thought about something a little bit more broader than social work? Because every kid that comes through Heart of LA because they've received, you know, a lot of social service, it's not uncommon that they say, I want to be a social worker and give that back, right? Mm-hmm. But we were trying to open their minds to say that, you know, maybe you could also be the next 
great teacher that inspires the next generation of students coming through it, right? So we partner with Bard College out of New York, Longy School of Music or Bard College. And what I'm proud to tell you is that we've had alumni from Heart of LA graduate college and then come back to Ola's campus mm. for a graduate degree credential program to become teachers in either music or history or literature in secondary schools across the city and across the country. Talk about a full circle experience. It's a full circle experience, but it's also, you know, the connectedness. I mean, they're connected to mm. higher ed in a way in which they weren't before, right? And that was only done not because I own a college, because I, I don't, but I could partner with one, mm-hmm. right? So I don't know. All of this is how I've learned that I could only do so much by myself, but I could do so much more if I elevate my team and share in the leadership. And if our leaders share in the leadership of making this world a better place with others, we all get connected to like-minded folks who want to just see this world be better for everybody. Mm. And collectively, you know, we can go about making you know, a bigger impact than we could if we tried to do it alone. You know, and I think the biggest one is LA City Recreation and Parks. You know, here we are on our campus. We're right across. At one point in time, we were right across the street from a neighborhood park that had a lot of issues that happened around the neighborhood, also happening in and around that park. And instead of just, you know, us running our programs and, you know, LA City Recreation and Parks running its programs, what would happen if we could come together, connect our services and programs? What could happen? Now, today, you see what's happened. It's a much safer neighborhood. It's a much safer community park. Uh, there's robust programs you know, um, for kids younger than six years old, as there are programs and services for families you know, who are trying to realize their potential across a myriad of programs that Heart of LA doesn't offer. So it's really, really exciting to be able to connect with folks around our city that's the only way I think we're going to make our city better and stronger is if we get out of our bubbles, right, and connect with one another. So inspiring. And we're at the part of the conversation now where you get to offer me a challenge for my Mm -hmm. quest. And those who are listening can choose to take the challenge as well. And sometimes I'm really clear when I bring somebody on the podcast what it is that I want to learn from them. And sometimes I'm not sure what the lesson is I'm supposed to take away until I'm in the conversation. And hearing you talk right now about partnership and vision, I'm feeling Mm. like there's some kind of challenge I want you to give me about Mother's Quest because... I've been feeling like there's some next level in terms of the vision that I have, that it's not really just about my own quest, that I really want to be building a community and a movement Mm -hmm. for moms to feel like we don't have to choose between being a mindful parent or making a really big difference in the world, that there's a way that both are possible and actually both become even more impactful and strengthened when we do both. But I've been feeling a little bit like the vision, I know I'm on a process, but I feel like it's meant to expand and I'm sort of at that point. Um, So I'm wondering if there's a challenge that you can give me and then anybody else who wants to take it about how to go about building some partnerships to grow Mm. a big vision. Oh my goodness. Okay. Wow. Well, I think then I would challenge folks if we're, if we're talking about partnerships, I had a different one in mind, but if we're talking about partnerships and how we could do that, I think everyone listening out there could think about a problem within their community that all are talking about amongst one another, right? Um, I know in our community here, we're talking an awful lot about how, gosh, you know, like my kids, my daughter, Penelope, I went to her, we have our kids in public school and I went to parent night, as we all did. And it was really, really interesting at parent night. The teacher got up there and said, oh, I'm so excited to tell you that we have art and PE at our school here at this school. So your daughter's in first grade and I'm happy to tell you she's going to have art. And I said, oh, great. What's it going to look like? Right. Is what I'm thinking. And I used to be a PE teacher. She says, well, PE is taught by me, the classroom teacher. And I teach it a couple times a week. For about a half an hour before recess. 
And then she said, and art, we have art once a month. <laughs> Again, taught by me, the classroom teacher. And sometimes, you know, we have a guest artist who comes in. And I thought to myself, this is horrible. And so it made me think, in what ways can we make this better for not only the kids in my daughter's school, but kids all across the city who have an even tougher challenge because they have parents who cannot afford now to go pay for a private you know, arts experience or more athletic or wellness opportunities for their kids outside of a public school system. And so to me, it becomes a challenge to figure out who do you partner with to make sure that kids have these types of opportunities and options in their lives. And so is there a community center that needs a little financial support or that needs mentors or any type of resource that serves kids who are attending particularly public schools in the community in which we all live? that we can partner with and can maybe we help them be part of the outreach. Maybe they can partner with our school and we can find ways to give more kids the kinds of programs and services that they deserve. Because I guarantee you in the private schools and cities across our state and across our country, kids are getting enough art, they're getting enough music, they're getting enough athletics. But what about the kids who aren't in private schools? What about our public school kids? What are they getting, right? And I would encourage us all all the listeners to find partners that could make sure that we can give our kids more than what's in their school day and in their lives now, particularly in communities, again, where people can't afford to pay for it. So I sort of feel like after school programs are under attack right now by our current administration and kids in public schools need help. They need our help and support more than ever. And so there are lots of partners within every community I've tended to notice through my work. You know, there's a really cool arts organization usually. There's a really cool music opportunity. How can we connect those folks to the kids in these public schools so that those kids have every opportunity they need to be their best self? Mm -hmm. That's what I like to challenge people to do. So I think I might take away a two-part challenge from this because my wheels are spinning also for Mother's Quest. Mm -hmm. So the first is based on the work that you do and what you just described, to step up in my own community, possibly at maybe Ryan's Middle School, which is a public school, and really figure out what is something that can enhance their after-school experience and how to not have it be something that they figure out alone, but we really look at what's another resource that we can bring in, yes. some incredible partnership that can bring something to those young people that they wouldn't otherwise have. And then I think for me, in terms of growing Mother's Quest, I just want to spend some time thinking about taking that same principle and determining what is it that I feel like the Mother's Quest community that I'm growing needs and how can I not feel like it has to all be provided by me, but that's right. where is there just even one partner to start with? that I can seek out and connect in some way to what I'm trying to do. Yes. So I'm going to work on both of those. Absolutely. We can do a lot by ourselves, but we can do more when we do it together, right? And I think that's always, I believe, how we should be thinking nowadays, particularly at a time when there's increasing separation between the haves and the have-nots. And also at a time when I feel like people are sort of retreating into their own bubbles, you know? How do we burst those bubbles and, and stay connected to our neighbors, you know, and to others who are in our community that we maybe don't always think about? How can we do that? So great. Well, Tony, it's very late. I'm looking outside and when we started our conversation, it was still light out. That's dark. <laughs> and I know we both were recording this on a Sunday evening now late and we both have our children to wake up and get to school in the morning. So I know I could talk with you a lot longer, but I think we should start to wrap it up. And we always do that with acknowledgements. So I want to share what some of the biggest takeaways and gifts are that I got from this conversation. And then I'd love to know what has surfaced for you. Great. Thank you. So I'm thinking about 
the gifts from Tony Brown that I take with me are this way in which you have been able to cultivate patience. You talked about it as a child, but then it was a thread that weaved through the work that you do with young people of really, you know, hanging in there with them on their journey. And that sometimes they have moments of failure or where things are really hard, but you stay connected and committed to them and you give them another opportunity and you've seen what is possible with that. I like this idea of jumping back in the pool noticing when in your life you maybe take a detour or aren't investing in yourself, but then how you were able to have the awareness that your life was so much fuller, that you weren't feeling like yourself without this thing that you really needed. So I'm going to carry that too of noticing when there are times maybe where I need to jump back in the pool for something that I've left behind. And then the other thing is just this idea of holding a really big vision of what's possible and remembering that the only way that we can have a big vision is if we don't think we have to do it by ourselves and really reach out and cultivate incredible partnerships. So I'm going to be thinking about how to do that for my own children in their environments and also then for growing mother's class. Mm. Thank you for shedding light on those, bringing them to this conversation. Well, I feel like this was a two-way conversation and we both got to those places and it's just been an honor to be on this show. You know, I think one of the interesting takeaways that I take away, not even interesting, but just profound to me is the experience that you shared about your family going through therapy and not so much that you went through therapy, it's why you went through therapy, what it was all about, about the orbiting around our kids. And you know, I see that you're an amazing mother. I see you have a wonderful family. I know your husband. I met you know, one of your children, and I look forward to meeting all of them. But that's a really tough thing to do, to not orbit around our kids all the time. And so even though that's what I'm trying to do, even though my mother, you know, demonstrated something very different, it is still very hard to do. And you went and sought some help to get there, and you shared what was helpful about that, and that's a blessing to me. Hmm. there's going to be probably an opportunity where I'm going to need to go (laughs) with my family and make sure that we're reminded of our practice, our day-to-day practice, and ensuring that our kids have what they need to be strong and be their strongest self. But for now, it makes me feel validated to know that I'm thinking the right way (laughs) and that my mom taught me Hmm. some good things, you know? Thank you so much, Tony. Have a great restful evening. Thank and you, thank you, you for the incredible work that you do. Well, thank you for the incredible work that you do too and keep doing it. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, head over to mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on iTunes, and help us spread the word. I want to end with some words to light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time.